right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center. Uh, for those of you that are not in the area or based in the area, um, welcome to D.C. during the most beautiful time of the year, the cherry blossom season. I hope you had a chance to, to look around while you're in town. Um, the Reagan Building is a special project of the U.S. General Services Administration. Uh, again, my name is Andrew Gelfuso, and I'm the trade director here. I'd like to welcome the Right Honorable Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister of Canada, Ambassador Doerr, honored guests, as well as members of the diplomatic development and business communities here today. I'd also like to welcome and thank the hosts of today's program, the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars. The Reagan Building is a mixed-use facility. Along with our special events and hospitality service, we pride ourselves on being an active hub for trade promotion, trade policy promotion, and various events and signature events throughout the year. We also serve as the World Trade Center for Washington, D.C., which connects us to our World Trade Center partners uh, in hundreds of countries throughout the world and gives us a, a wonderful network to promote the events that do take place here at the Trade Center. Our partners here in Washington include various government agencies, NGOs, and think tanks, which foster international dialogue, generate business opportunities, and educate the public right here in the nation's capital. The conversation this afternoon will offer us all better insight into U.S.-Canada relations as we are on the heels of the trilateral North America Leaders Summit, which was held today at the White House. We thank the Wilson Center for assembling the prestigious panel this afternoon, and I'm certain that the program will be thought-provoking uh, for all of us here today. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's host, the Honorable Jane Harmon, Director, President, and CEO of the Wilson Center. Thank you all. Thank you, Andrew, and good afternoon to everyone. I hope the irony is not lost on you that the Woodrow Wilson Center, the living memorial to our 28th president and our only PhD president, uh, who happened to be a member of the Democratic Party, is in the Ronald Reagan Building. <laughs> I only wish we had more bipartisanship uh, going on about a mile from here. Uh, I have been the uh, director, president, and CEO for the Wilson Center for about a year. On day three of my tenure here, uh, I had the pleasure of welcoming Mexican uh, President Felipe Calderon to speak in this room uh, in the Ronald Reagan Building. Um, so it seems like bookends today to welcome our other North American neighbor, Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, um, to the Wilson Center's Director's Forum. Uh, as you probably know, all of you, uh, the, the Mexican president and Prime Minister Harper joined President Obama uh, in the Rose Garden just a couple hours ago uh, to uh, talk about the meeting the three of them had this morning. I'm sure we will hear more about that in just a moment. But let me also uh, recognize and welcome a few more people. Uh, Wilson Center Chairman Joe Gildenhorn, Ambassador Joe Gildenhorn, and his wife Alma, a member of our council. Uh, the Honorable Ed Fast, who is the Canadian Minister for International Trade. Uh, the Honorable John Baird, Canada's Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Miss uh, Sarah Radicke, the Ambassador of Canada to Mexico. And uh, he's already been acknowledged, but my good friend, uh, Ambassador Gary Doerr, uh, who is Canada's Ambassador to the United States. Uh, as a recovering politician and now head of this nonpartisan institution, I want this audience to know how impressed I am that Prime Minister Harper chose Gary Dewar, um, the former new Democratic Party Premier of Manitoba, to be Canada's ambassador to this country. Uh, such bipartisanship is to be applauded, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, very rare in this country these days. Ambassador Dewar invited me to lunch at the Canadian Embassy uh, a few months ago and in addition to having the most gorgeous embassy in town, he demonstrated an iPad app that shows Canada's contribution to the economy of each state and each U.S. congressional district. A great way to show our Congress why this relationship matters to their constituents. With me at lunch that day was David Biet, who is the director of the Wilson Center's Remarkable Canada Institute. David worked hard to bring the Prime Minister here today, and we're all pleased that his efforts were successful. One housekeeping note. 
After my conversation with the Prime Minister, which should last about 30 minutes of the hour we have, uh, we will take some questions from the audience. If you have a question, uh, please write it on a note card, which I think you have, and uh, one of the ushers will pick it up, and then we will cluster the questions and put them to the Prime Minister. Uh, in this audience, some may feel Prime Minister Harper needs no introduction, as Canada is such a close ally and neighbor, uh, but I thought I'd just add a few notes. Stephen Harper has spoken up boldly for Israel, and Canada has been a loyal coalition partner in some of the toughest fighting in Afghanistan over the years. His handling of, the Canadian, uh, of Canada's economy through the recession and his role at meetings of the G8 and G20, the next of those G20 meetings is in Los Cabos in Mexico in June, has, has attracted widespread approval. The World Economic Forum says Canada's banks are the soundest in the world. Not a single Canadian bank failed during the long recession. Forbes magazine ranks Canada as the best place on earth to invest. Wrap that around, the best place on earth to, to invest. Uh, alas, no one has said that about the United States lately. So now hear the back story, or the back political story. Before Stephen Harper could contest an election, he first had to, qualify, to unify the Canadian Alliance and the Progressive Conservatives to form the Conservative Party of Canada. To do so, he fought two leadership campaigns. Once he became leader, he fought four elections. He has governed as Prime Minister in some of the most challenging economic and security circumstances since the Second World War. The Wilson Center was obviously prescient six years ago when we bestowed the, Wil the Wil Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service on Mr. Harper. Receiving the award, he was modest and said, quote, as someone who has only served Canada as Prime Minister for eight months, I'm not sure I've yet merited this recognition. Well, Prime Minister Harper, you've served your country for six years now, and you have surely revived Canadian leadership on the world stage. We know we didn't make a mistake when we gave you the award. So ladies and gentlemen, the Right Honorable Stephen Harper, Prime Minister of Canada, uh, will join me in these chairs and make a few opening remarks. Uh, I believe that he will open in French, but he promises that he will translate uh, his French remarks, as he just did in the White House, uh, so that the rest of you uh, can understand. And um, we will, as I said, then go directly to questions and to your questions. Please welcome the Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper. Thank you, Jane. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Jane, for that kind introduction. I will uh, be very brief. Je suis ici pour uh, le sommet des uh, chefs nord-américains pour discuter uh, de divers sujets, comme Paris, uh, évidemment, l'économie, uh, la sécurité dans l'hémisphère, et uh, aussi uh, nos valeurs démocratiques quand on approche au sommet uh, des Amériques uh, à la Colombie. Uh, so I'm here uh, primarily today, as I just said, to uh, meet with President, as you mentioned, President Obama, President Calderon, uh, really to discuss our shared North American agenda, obviously the economy and the competitiveness of this region in the context of the recovery from the global recession. Also, we discuss the common security challenges that we increasingly have in this hemisphere. And we discuss the promotion of democratic values as we approach the Summit of the Americas, which will be held in Cartagena, Colombia, very shortly. Um, this has been, uh, I guess today, uh, you're probably aware, former uh, President de la Madrid uh, of uh, Mexico passed away. And he was, of course, one of the architects of the NAFTA agreement. And this has been a burgeoning three-way relationship ever since then, so we do meet periodically to discuss these interests of shared concern. And of course, we always, we never miss an opportunity to discuss our relationship with the United States, which for Canada, as you know, uh, remains uh, overwhelmingly important. Um, but as, I, you know, I know this crowd knows, but as too many Americans don't uh, know, uh, Canada-U.S. economic relationship is the largest economic relationship in history. 
largest trade relationship in history. Um, $700 billion a year now in trade. We are uh, the number one export des uh, destination for the United States. This give an idea of the scale. I say most Americans do not understand anything like these numbers. The United States exports more to Canada than it does to the BRIC countries, UK and Germany combined. And of course, we're also your largest supplier, external supplier of energy, and 25% of all oil exports come from Canada, larger than any Middle Eastern, individual Middle Eastern country. So, so we never miss an opportunity to discuss the very important uh, trade and other relationships we have with this great, great country here. Well, thank you. Um, un peu de français ou ça va? <laughs> bon, allons. Now we will talk in English. Um, I, let me start with competitiveness and innovation because as I listen to uh, what the President said and what you have just said and what President Calderon said, I mean, we are talking about when you add in Mexico a trillion plus dollar market right. if you talk about the three countries of North America. And um, that, that starts to add up to real money and real clout. Uh, one of the things on the President's list um, that was agreed to today, I think, was a, a joint regime for simplifying regulatory reform. Uh, at the Wilson Center last week, we had a, uh, a meeting on uh, American innovation and competitiveness. And of course, one of the subjects that came up was stifling regulation. Uh, what could that agreement mean, and what are some other ways uh, to spur uh, competitiveness and reach, you know, take the trillion we now have and multiply that by a lot in some near term? Well, in terms of um, regulation, and what we really were talking about today is uh, follows from agreements that have been made earlier bilaterally between the United States and Mexico, and obviously as well between the United States and Canada that we just uh, put into effect in the last few months what we call the Regulatory Cooperation Council. We have officials working, have been working for several months now and working with industry on a range of ways that we can standardize, harmonize, simplify uh, regulatory differences between our countries. Um, particularly for Canada, this is obviously a huge concern. We, we uh, often, somebody used the expression earlier today, we are often captive of the tyranny of small differences. And we want to find a way with our largest trading partner to make our border as seamlessly as, as possible. And dealing with uh, regulatory simplification and standardizations, a big part of that. And I met with the business community earlier. I mean, everybody's very engaged in this. And this, this is uh, very important work going forward. Now, I think we're, we're going to look as well as to see how these two bilateral exercises could, could result in some you know, trilateral agreements as well. In Canada, we're going a step farther. Uh, we're not concerned merely with, uh, with uh, kind of the micro-regulatory environment. We just introduced a uh, national budget in Canada last week, our next stage of what we call our economic action plan. One of the things we're doing there is we are trying to streamline uh, project approval, uh, particularly for major resource developments. We have tremendous opportunity, not just here, but obviously now in Asia, uh, to develop and to find new markets for Canadian resources. And we have found in recent years that increasingly our regulatory process, as well necessary for good environmental reasons, are often uh, becoming very long, uh, creating a lot of uncertainty for business. So we're uh, legislating clear timelines it doesn't guarantee people will get the answer they want, but clear timelines so we can create more certainty for investment and ultimately bring more projects to fruition quickly. Well, I'll get to the energy question, yeah. which I know you all want answers to in a moment, but staying on this just for a bit, uh, you have been able to do things uh, in terms of your budget that we can only dream of here. Um, and obviously, I think everyone gets the fact that a healthy budget environment also spurs your economy and um, uh, can hopefully fix any, any other issues related to economic growth. How did you, how were you able, how was Canada able uh, to, to stay, I wouldn't call it healthy during the lowest point, but to stay healthier 
than the United States and obviously Europe and other parts of the world? Well, there's, there's been three big differences in Canada. Um, first has been we had a very solid system of financial institution regulation. One that's not entirely translatable here, but one that is, I think, helping to form the basis of some of the international efforts that are going on to reform financial sector regulation. So we had a strong financial sector, we had strong household and corporate balance sheets as well, and we also had, we had a strong, this is a big difference, we had a strong fiscal position going into the recession. Not only was the government of Canada and most provincial governments, not only were we running surpluses, but we had debt levels that were very low which meant uh, a couple of things, which meant, uh, you know, obviously our fiscal position solid, but also meant we had a lot more flexibility. And we did a very large scale stimulus program in Canada in the order of uh, $60 billion, which, you know, it's comparable to what was done here. But the difference was, um, because we had such a low debt level, we could incur that kind of deficit in the short term without worrying about the effect on our, 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 on our interest burden down the road. So we did that, we've withdrawn that stimulus uh, quite quickly as uh, the recovery has taken effect. But I say that's made all the difference, having that fiscal flexibility, and, and we're determined to preserve that. We've we said all along that the stimulus we put in would be temporary, we didn't create any, uh, we didn't create any new bureaucracy that would want to sustain that. And uh, now we're moving very quickly in the context of a majority government and a parliamentary system. We are, you have a lot more flexibility. That makes a difference. It does. We're, uh, we're moving uh, quickly now to ensure that we do return to balance. And we will return to balance in the, uh, in the course of this uh, mandate. In fact, we're, we're about half. And we may even be a little less than half the deficit we had at the height. And we should be, by 2015 at the latest, in balance. In balance. Wow. Um, can you, I would just be curious, can you give us a little more information about what the stimulus program did and how you were able to avoid an overhead, you know, a bureaucracy sure. to, to get the money to where it needed to go? Well, there were a lot of components to the stimulus program in Canada, but the lion's share was essentially the federal government funding a portion of you know, so-called shovel-ready projects, of infrastructure already planned and close to launch infrastructure projects of other levels of government, colleges, universities, and in a few cases, the private sector. So you know, what we did is we went for projects that were already gonna go ahead. We just accelerated the timelines. We, as I say, largely did it outside of our own government. And we required, in most cases, contributions from all other partners. So they had a, not just a stake financially, they also had a stake in the thing not being indefinite. And so we found that was, uh, you know, that was a pretty, uh, pretty effective program. And was program. there and private got, sector money in those too? Uh, very public? few. There were some private sector projects, but they were mostly intergovernmental projects. And was there tax revenue involved in some of this? I mean, for example, in Los Angeles, close to my heart, there is a program called, or it hasn't been realized yet, 3010, uh, 30, and, the, and the goal is to take some of the sales tax that's been dedicated in Los Angeles, apply it to the build out of infrastructure, but get the federal government to front load uh, some of the money so that instead of it taking 30 years paid for by tax revenue, it will take 10 and it will create tens of thousands of jobs. Is, is that the kind well, of thing you yeah, did? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have uh, anything quite like that. As I say, we did require um, shares from the other participants, mm -hmm. which were mostly provinces and municipalities. And um, we also did have available uh, for some municipalities a loan facility, although it actually wasn't that broadly used. But, uh, but we didn't use tax revenue per se. Did not? Yeah. Well, we have a, a variation on that proposal called an infrastructure bank, which sounds like that. Um, let me turn to energy, a subject that everyone cares about. Uh, Canada is rich in energy resources. Uh, today, the president talked about uh, a joint effort among the three countries to build clean energy jobs. Uh, my question is this, it relates to energy security. I think that would be the least polarizing word we could use. Um, do you see a possibility of North America, again, the three countries, uh, 
putting in a, you know, in, into the game the energy resources we have with pipeline and other capacity to move those resources around and achieving energy security. That would mean no reliance on Middle Eastern oil. At least that's what it would mean to me. Uh, it could mean other things. But the ability to, to um, basically power whatever our needs are. Some mix of uh, clean energy and oil resources and other. And if you can see that future, uh, what role do pipelines play? Um, does the decision to delay a portion of the, of the Keystone XL pipeline affect that timeline? And uh, does Canada's interest uh, in, in having other energy partners, especially in Asia, uh, dilute the possibility that Canada will bring enough energy to the table to achieve this North American uh, energy security uh, objective? Well, first of all, there's, uh, you know, there's several portions to that question. Canada's, Canada, uh, you know, I, I like to say that whatever the energy mix of the future is, Canada will be a major supplier. Canada is, you know, among the top two or three in virtually every single energy source that is, uh, that is out there. So energy security for us, not that we don't have our energy challenges, but energy security for Canada has never meant the same thing that it does for the United States. We don't have the same uh, kind of fundamental uh, threat of, uh, of an energy shortage. In the case of, uh, of North America as a whole though, obviously the, the shale gas developments, the developments in natural gas in particular, uh, you know, as President Obama said earlier today, have a uh, capacity for enormous geopolitical mm -hmm. shifts. Mm -hmm. uh, U.S. is uh, particularly uh, rich in uh, natural gas of that variety. And this does create the potential for North America as a whole uh, to be essentially not, not just energy self-sufficient, but an energy exporter. Now, in fairness, though, I've got to say that Canada's interests here are, are a little bit different. Um, and particularly, I might as well be frank, particularly in light of the, of the uh, interim decision, at least on, on Keystone, what it really has highlighted for Canada is that our issue when it comes to energy and energy security is not North American self-sufficiency. Our energy is the necessity of diversifying our energy export markets. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot be, as a country, in a situation where uh, really our, our one and in many cases almost only energy partner could say no to our energy products. We just cannot be in that kind of position. And the truth of the matter is that when it comes to oil in particular, we do face a significant discount on the marketplace because of the fact that we're a captive supplier. So we have made it clear to the people of Canada, one of our national priorities is to make sure that we have the infrastructure and the capacity uh, to export our energy products outside of North America. Now look, we're still going to be a major supplier of the United States. I, it'll be a long time, if ever, before the United States isn't our number one export market. But for us, the United States cannot be our only export market. That is not in our interests, either uh, uh, commercially or even, as I say, in terms of price. Can clean energy be an increasing part of the mix? I mean, it does seem to me we're trying to export clean energy technology too to right. Asia, especially to China and solar and other issues are, are in that mix. Um, but today, at least as I was hearing President Obama, he was talking about clean energy. And obviously, if we have a, an easy choice between dirtier forms of energy and clean energy, who wouldn't take clean energy? So how, how big a piece of the energy pie do you think that is? Well, clean energy is going to be a growing part of the mix. You know, as far as fossil fuels goes, natural gas is a, is a cleaner form, and that's where, that's where the, uh, the growth is. Um, in terms of clean energy and climate change, we have engaged in quite cooperative actions with the Obama administration, for instance, on transportation regulation uh, to try and get uh, better and cleaner energy usage. And like the United States, we also invest in you know, newer technologies, wind, solar, uh, tidal, um, uh, carbon capture and storage, you know, all kinds of, of uh, energy innovations. But I mean, the truth of the matter is this, that, uh, and, and you know, I know this is not necessarily a popular thing to say, but the truth of the matter is that if you look at supply and demand curves for energy in the future, um, 
the demand for hydrocarbons is going to remain enormous, yeah. even with the growth of, uh, of clean energy sources. In fact, the argument I make to, to many people, especially those who are more skeptical of, of climate change, is that if you simply look at supply and demand issues, I mean, we've got to be uh, finding ways to get uh, plentiful, reasonably cost uh, sources of energy outside of hydrocarbons because I'm not sure right. that hydrocarbon production in the long term, can, certainly oil production, cannot keep up right. with demand. That's why, that's why there is, uh, you know, not just right now, but over the last several years, a rising price of oil. It, it, it's simply a, a supply and demand phenomenon. So, look, I, the way I see the energy of the future, we're going to have, we're going to have lots of hydrocarbons still in the mix, including uh, increased natural gas. Um, as unpopular as it also is, nuclear is going to have to be a growing part of the mix, notwithstanding the challenges and risks of nuclear energy. It remains the other, the only other today, large-scale, right. reasonably cost, uh, reasonably cost-effective uh, option. Um, other options that we all have great hope for uh, today are either not large-scale or they are not reasonably priced. Well, I share your view on nuclear, and I have. The challenge is obviously safe storage of spent fuel. And there are some new ideas. There also is this idea, which I know you're familiar with, about an international fuel bank that could provide for this function around the world. That might be, in some future lifetime, an answer to Iran. In fact, it was talked about a few years back, the fuel bank would have been in Russia, but it could be a worldwide solution. The IAEA has talked about that too, for all countries that are engaged in civil nuclear energy production. At any rate, uh, there's lots more to talk about car production, clean engines. I mean, the Canada-US collaboration on cars is huge. Most people don't understand that uh, exports between the US and Canada keep adding content on both sides of the border. The same thing is true in Mexico. The average, so, the average car, it's just the stat I like yeah. to use, the average car, North American car, when being produced, crosses the border 16 times as it's, it's being assembled. And, and uh, Wilson just did, I have to show for the Wilson Center one more time, the Mexico Institute, some research on our uh, shared border with Mexico, which shows that 40% of the content of exports to Mexico or, or, and imports from Mexico is contributed by both sides of the border. Right. So it's very different from an import-export relationship with China or pick a, pick a country. Let's just finally turn to foreign policy. And David Biet, if you have these cards, you need to be bringing them up to me. So if anyone has these questions, I hope you've handed them off someplace, please. Um, foreign policy. Uh, as I told you, my uh, focus in Congress was on uh, intelligence and security. We have an extraordinarily close intelligence relationship with Canada and have had it for years. And on security, Canada has been our, uh, our, our closest ally, or certainly one of them, in, in terms of the things we have done and are doing in the Middle East region, hard things. Uh, one of those hard things is trying to find uh, some better answers on Syria. Yeah. And uh, I did ask uh, Prime Minister Harper whether his country was at the Friends of Syria meeting over the weekend in Istanbul, attended by Secretary of State Clinton, answered yes. Um, they have decided tentatively, at least as I understand it, or we have decided with some others, uh, to provide some um, humanitarian aid and communications equipment to the opposition in Syria. Uh, how do you assess that, and w are there any better answers? And if we could break Syria away from Iran, um, my suggestion has been to grant uh, immunity to the Bashar al-Assad family and hopefully get them out of the country and do what we did in we, the, uh, a collection of friendly states in Yemen, to uh, provide a stable alternative government. But <coughs> if we can't achieve that, how, how do you, as the leader of Canada, see a way forward? Well, first of all, we, <coughs> we agree with the United States and with all our allies that uh, there is no resolution without, uh, the, without Assad stepping down and stepping aside. I mean, that, is, that is an essential uh, part of this, and we're working cooperatively with all our allies in the sanctions regime, and obviously 
it would be helped along if, uh, if all members of the Security Council were, uh, were cooperating uh, with our objectives here. This is, though, you know, I think we have to be, be frank in saying this is a more complex situation than we faced in Libya. You know, in Libya, we faced um, essentially a family regime. Where Canada played a very leading role. We, we, we played a significant role. Uh, General Bouchard uh, was the commander of the NATO forces. We're very mm -hmm. proud of the work uh, he did out of NATO. But in, in the case of Libya, we faced a family regime and a widespread um, consensus and a, and a widely formed opposition against mm -hmm. that regime. In the case of Syria, uh, it is more complex. The support for the Assad regime is deeper mm -hmm. um, in some segments of the population than certainly it was uh, in Libya in the, in the case of Gaddafi. And the opposition is much more fragmented. And uh, the, the, the possibility of prolonged and widespread and dangerous chaos is much more marked. So, you know, I think what we would all like to see is obviously we'd like to see more unity among, John Baird just came back from Friends of Syria, we'd like to see more unity and strength among the opposition, but we'd also obviously like to see the government um, make changes and reach out and, and work with the opposition. It's hard to see how this ends well if both sides don't do that. Um, our, our assessment right. is that, you know, the government, uh, the, the opposition does not appear strong enough to overthrow the government, and, and it's not clear uh, to us that there would be a, a unified opposition if that it did take place. And it also appears, and it should be, you would think, clear to Assad and his uh, people now that it doesn't appear that any amount of repression is actually going to stop the opposition or the rebellion or the, the demonstrations. So, um, you know, as I say, it would be greatly helpful if we could get all members of the Security Council pulling towards a resolution, but we don't have that today. Right. Well, I need some questions in my hands. Um, is somebody bringing them? I assume you're asking questions. How many of you have written questions down on a card? Um, we need this. Well, I, the deal, here he is. The question man has arrived. Um, this was the plan we had. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. We've received questions on Keystone XL. What a surprise. Yeah. Um, uh, here they are. Here was a summary of it. Americans are concerned about increased greenhouse gas emissions from oil sands. Should companies be forced to offset their oil sands production with greener production? And let me just ask these together. And if Keystone XL can be approved after the U.S. presidential election, will this affect your government's position on the Northern Gateway Pipeline? Right. Well, first of all, um, I think, uh, first of all, I, uh, you know, everything I've seen in the United States indicates pretty overwhelming public opinion in favor of the uh, Keystone Pipeline. President Obama has told me repeatedly that this decision will ultimately be made on the basis of its merits, and I have no reason uh, not to believe him on that. Um, but in terms, look, I think there's two, two things, three things that are very important to say about this uh, uh, Keystone Pipeline. The first is one should not um, in any way minimize the sheer economic scale of this. I mean, this has the capacity of employing uh, up to 30,000 people on both sides of the border. This is a huge energy product that, uh, project that will have uh, enormously positive employment and economic activity effects across a range of industries in both countries, which is why business and labor are so strongly uh, supportive of it. Uh, secondly, um, we talked about this earlier, energy security. Um, the United States, there, there, it is not possible for the United States to get a friendlier and more secure supply of oil than, uh, f than anywhere than from Canada. I mean, it's just. And if one looks at the options, uh, Middle East, Venezuela, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's so obvious that this is the better option for energy security. The third is that the environmental impacts of this should not be exaggerated. You know, oil sands oils, while they are heavy in emissions, are no heavier than typical heavy crudes, no heavier than Venezuelan, for example, which is where a lot of the displaced oil mm -hmm. uh, will be from. 
Um, so I say not that there are not was not that there aren't environmental challenges in the oil sands. They are, but they should not be exaggerated or somehow unique or somehow out of the mainstream of the oil industry. That's just uh, not the case. Um, in terms of your second part of your question, would yeah. would uh, would uh, approval oh. of this yeah. change our mind? Ah. Uh, the answer yeah. is no. Um, look, uh, the very fact that a no could even be said. Um, underscores to our country that we must diversify our energy export markets. But as I say, we have uh, taken um, a significant price hit by virtue of the fact that we're a captive supplier. And that just does not make sense in terms of the broader interests of the uh, Canadian economy. And look, um, I'm a, a strong and firm believer in the uh, importance, not just the economic importance of our relationship with the security importance and the importance of the United States in the world. But we cannot, we cannot take this to the point where we are creating risk and significant economic penalty to the Canadian economy. And to not diversify to Asia when Asia is the growing part of the world just simply makes no sense to Canada. Well, I, I, uh, that Canada has every right to take that position. And I don't speak for the Obama administration. But I do think uh, most Americans would prefer to buy oil from Canada than from a, a long list I of other countries. So, yeah. uh, but I also think in, in, in our country with a strong environmental movement, there is this issue, which if you could just say a few words about it, about offsets, because as you say, it's a heavy crude and we buy it from other places. But I think a lot of people are concerned about that. And there were some concerns, I, I assume there still are, about the rooting of the pipeline, or at least the northern yeah, part I th of the Yeah, my understanding is the rooting concerns uh, have been addressed in, in Nebraska itself. You know, offsets, uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm much of a believer in offsets. I think if you're concerned about, if you're concerned about emissions, you find a way of controlling emissions. You know, offsets are, uh, are a, a way of pretending you've addressed the missions when you really haven't. Changing the subject. Um, <laughs> when will Canada and the United States, I guess the question to you is when will Canada, uh, decide to form a customs union? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I think that's a purely theoretical question because uh, I certainly, you know, since we've, we've, sign NAFTA. There's obviously been a tremendous uh, growth in trade and integration and integration of supply chains between our, between our economies. But I have sensed no appetite, particularly in the United States, to take uh, the economic relationship to any fundamentally deeper level than it is today um, in terms of things like a customs union. So I just don't think that's in the cards, particularly in the context of NAFTA. And it probably has um, more to do with the Mexican-American relationship than with the American-Canadian relationship. But nevertheless, I think that's the situation. What we have done with the Obama administration mm -hmm. is we have this Beyond the Border initiative right. where we are finding ways of avoiding uh, duplicative screening when we cross the border, where we're finding ways of doing more and more of our of our uh, screening and uh, security checks on the perimeter of the continent rather than at the border. So these are ways to, uh, to significantly increase integration and, and trade and tourism flow across the border. But I don't think, I just don't see a customs union being in the cards. I also think those are very smart initiatives. You know, we, another term for that is a smart border. Yeah. And, and, and pushing the border out that way is smart. We, we did that in the United States, States with something we call the Safe Ports Act, which requires cargo, which can be a great risk to our country, to be, to, to be screened at the point of embarkation in China or some other Asian port, pick that, uh, and then the cargo secure across the ocean so that when it arrives at our ports, it isn't dangerous. It also speeds up commerce. I mean, there are ways to mesh these priorities, and it seems to me that initiative. We're increasingly was trying to adopt the, the view, yeah. you know, something, well, I forget what the exact term is, checked once and verified twice, essentially. It's once, mm. it's once it's checked in one country, it's good in both. I'm checking my watch, but I think we still have more time, so I could use a few more questions, unless I can't see that clock very well, which I can't. 
Um, but here's one. You have made the Arctic a central priority in your domestic and foreign policy. Ice in the Arctic Ocean has been melting at unprecedented rates, causing concern among some, but opening previously unavailable resources as well as new shipping routes. Is the Arctic a place for cooperation or competition? Where does Canada fit? Well, it's probably a, uh, it's probably a place for a what little bit of both. It? Um, what time is it? It is, uh, it is true that it is true that more of the ice is melting. It's also true that I think the economics of commodity prices are going to drive resource development in areas like the Arctic mm -hmm. where costs are higher and where traditionally it's been, been harder to make uh, economic projects uh, viable. Um, we, we have put a big emphasis, I mean a big part of our country is actually in the Arctic region. We put a big emphasis on securing our sovereignty there and seeing those resources develop, not just for the benefit of the country, but particularly for the economic opportunity of the, of the people who live there. Through the Arctic Council and others, we, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we do cooperate. We're cooperating on, for instance, on the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the mapping of the Arctic seabed and the, and the resolution of, of various uh, claims. But those things all said, there will be, as, as there are in all parts of the world these days, there will also be some pretty, uh, I think, increasing, increasingly intense uh, competition for, uh, for uh, economic activity in that part of the world. Changing the subject back to the border, um, can we do more on each side of the border, such as biometrics? to allow good people to cross faster and easier. Yeah, uh, the Beyond the Border initiative I mentioned earlier uh, enhanced investments in biometrics, in information sharing uh, between our, our various security agencies. Those are all part of the program that we put together with the Obama administration. The principle is really, uh, is really very simple. It's how do, we, how do we increase the ability of ordinary businesses, ordinary travelers and tourists, friends and neighbors, to cross the border regularly and seamlessly while at the same time uh, being able to identify risks and threats and identify them early and okay. often away from the border. And infra biometrics, information sharing, all of those things are part of the answer to that, to that equation. I'm, um, you know, I'm of the strong view that, um, you know, we've seen, this, we've seen this all over the place. I'm of the strong view that you know, checking millions and millions of people, uh, making them go through lineups, making them go through screening, is, is not in and of itself an effective way to identify the potentially dangerous. And we have to have more sophisticated ways of doing that. Well, I think you were just describing TSA. Uh, but uh, the, having, having talked to the, having been at, in at the creation, uh, I just would uh, say a couple things. One, we're getting smarter about how we do that. But two, we have in our country, and I assume you do too, layered security. We don't just have one way to try to catch people. And these things are all deterrents. Unfortunately, they're also, some of them, enormous inconveniences and seem very silly. Uh, but I would just point out one of the things that TSA has always hit with is, well, why do little kids have to be checked or babies? Well, if some of the folks uh, trying to attack us have no respect for human life and are happy to use babies or little kids, um, you know, put explosives underneath them or strap them things onto them, and uh, it's, it's highly unfortunate, but they don't value life the way we do. So therefore, we do need processes sometimes that, that look at people who would not logically or likely in most cases be suspects. But changing the subject to healthcare, which didn't come up. I didn't raise it, you didn't raise it either. Uh, it's kind of a big topic in this country in the last several weeks. Uh, as the head of a country with long-standing universal healthcare, do you see this as a budgetary burden or boon? That's a, that's a. Thank you, it's, questioner. It's a Pretty tough question. You know, it, it depends on the context. Uh, many Canadian businesses will tell you that having a universal single payer system uh, simplifies life for them and reduces the cost of doing business. On the other hand, we can't uh, fool people and not tell you that the growth of, the sheer growth of healthcare budgets in Canada 
uh, is a serious concern to, uh, to all senior governments. Healthcare budgets over a long period of time have been growing faster than our economy. Now, mind you, I would make, Jane, I would make this observation that I know that the, the healthcare system of the United States is very different than the healthcare system of Canada. And, you know, all Western developed countries have variants of, of, uh, of uh, a mixed healthcare system. My observation would be that in spite of these various differences, the problems that afflict virtually all of them are the same. And that is uh, the costs and the pressures on them keep growing faster than the ability of Western countries to sustain economic growth. Um, why is that? I think there are two reasons. One is that the uh, fact of the matter is, and this is a good thing, the fact of the matter is that nowadays we can do so much in terms of health care, so much in terms of curing people and extending life. Um, in fact, if we have an unlimited supply of money, we can almost do an unlimited amount of things. The problem is we don't have an unlimited supply of money, so we have to find ways of limiting it. But our capacity to improve and sustain life is, has grown enormously over the, next, over the past uh, couple of generations. That's a more difficult problem. The other problem, of course, is that our economies are not growing fast enough. And this is something I've talked to the Canadian people about. I mean, you know, we just won a, a national election in Canada uh, by emphasizing the fact that the Canadian economy has done so, so much better than other developed uh, economies over the past uh, several years during the recession and the recovery. Okay. But the truth of the matter is that's not a very good measure because um, you know, most developed economies aren't growing um, the way uh, they need to be growing. And one of the things we have got to do in Canada and everywhere is find ways of increasing the productive capacity and the growth capacity of our economy. That's why, you know, as I say, we just tabled a budget. We had a whole range of, mm -hmm. of measures there not just the fiscal measures and not just the regulatory measures I talked about, but immigration and innovation and other kinds of measures so that we can, uh, we can keep uh, growing our economy and keep funding programs like our healthcare program, uh, which our citizens want and our citizens value. But the truth of the matter is, and I, I, say, I try to say this is a wake-up call to Canadians, but I would say the same thing here in the United States and in Europe, um, you know, I, I traveled to Asia, and I, I know many people in the audience do here in other parts of the world, and when you see these big emerging economies, I mean, these people are smart, they are hungry, and they are hardworking, and unless we find ways of competing with them and growing, uh, we're going to be under considerable pressure, regardless of what the nature of our healthcare system is, and that's the real challenge we have. Well, I'm, I surely agree. I think everyone agrees. The challenges are hard. One of the big issues that, that came up during the health care fight I was then in Congress was this issue of rationing care and, um, and the disproportionate amount spent at the end of life as against the beginning of life. I assume you have those same issues, Absolutely. even with national health care. Absolutely. Well, in some ways, even more. It's in some yeah. ways, even more, because yeah. they're, benef I guess, defined benefits that go to a certain point. And then well, the, we government is, the government's the sole provider, so uh, that lands directly on the government's lap. And, and, you know, frankly, it's the provincial government's do in Canada, but figuring out how to ration those services and how to make the best use of the dollars is an incre are, are increasingly difficult decisions. Right. Uh, all right. Well, we have uh, a lot of other questions, and I think we, I can't really see, but I think we have 11 minutes to go or so. Um, so let's just pick a few random ones. Uh, this one about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, it did come up today about the TPP and Canada's interest in joining it and Mexico's too. And I think uh, President Obama was asked uh, whether he would support that, and I believe he said yes. He uh, was very positive in his comments. So this question conference. is, when will Canada join the TPP? <laughs> You're the Prime Minister. Well, we expect Canada you to know the answer yeah. to this. Well, Canada has certainly uh, indicated our uh, strong interest. We have a, we have a very aggressive uh, trade negotiation agenda. I, I remind people that when our government took office in 2006, in spite of the fact that we are one of the most open trading economies in the developed world, Canada had trade agreements with only five countries in the entire world, which was one of the absolute lowest. We've signed trade deals with nine additional countries, and we're in the process of negotiating with 50 others. 
including right now the European Union, who are still optimistic about signing an agreement with this year, with Japan, with India. And uh, so our interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership is only natural. We already have agreements with three of the countries uh, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, including obviously the United States. And our strong sense is that most um, is that most of the members of the Trans-Pacific Partnership would like to see Canada join. Um, I think there's uh, some debate, uh, particularly within the administration, about uh, about the merits of that. But you know, our strong view is that if we're to build on the North American advantage, the integration we have in here in NAFTA, and frankly, to get around the table where you want some people who have some shared interests it makes sense for all three of the NAFTA partners to be part of this. Um, we have, I'll put these together, a couple more environmental questions and then uh, another border question. Um, you have just instituted spending cuts and this questioner has heard that there will be cuts to air quality programs. Um, he wants, to, or he or she wants to know uh, whether Canadian scientists can continue to collaborate with their US counterparts and Another question, but it could be answered together, is what role should hydropower play in Canada's clean energy exports to the U.S.? Yeah. First of all, on, uh, just on the, the government's uh, budgetary savings, the scale of our savings program in Canada is really very modest compared to what you're reading about in most Western developed countries. Our budgetary plan to get back to balance involves essentially a 2% reduction in federal spending over a three-year period. So this is not, uh, these are not enormous sums of money and what we are trying to do in all kinds of areas of government is essentially find ways, I won't say we aren't cutting some programs, but we're essentially trying to find ways that we can deliver uh, similar services uh, and goods to the Canadian public at, uh, frankly, a lesser cost than we've been doing so. And we believe there's lots of room for efficiency in the federal government. I hear rumors about that in the federal government here as well. Um, so look, uh, I, you know, our, our, the fact that we engage in air quality uh, programs and collaboration with our American counterparts, that, that uh, isn't going to change. What was the second part? Of the hydropower. Question? Oh, hydropower. Well, we already a significant exporter of, of hydro energy to the United States, mm -hmm. both from Manitoba does some, and Quebec, of course, is the very big exporter of, uh, of hydropower, and we have a fairly uh, integrated uh, electricity market between our two countries already. But look, there's, there's lots of capacity mm -hmm. um, for Canada to uh, dramatically increase its hydroelectric power and to export more of that power to the United States. Now, this is one form of energy we will not be exporting to Asia. Uh, so we have... <laughs> That would be tricky. Yeah, we have, uh, we have tremendous capacity for growth here. Um, and there, there are regulatory obstacles on both sides of the border. We're addressing the ones on our side of the border and think it would make a lot of sense for the United States to find ways of purchasing more clean hydropower from Canada. Uh, speaking of borders, um, this is very specific. The new bridge between Windsor and Detroit will help make our borders seamless why not forge an agreement with President Obama on this? Yeah, um, we, we have been working with uh, American governments for some years. Um, some of you may know that there are uh, unusual circumstances, I will just say, around the uh, Detroit-Windsor mm -hmm. crossing that we're, uh, we're trying to overcome. Uh, we think it is essential, um, well, you know, let's, uh, Let's be frank about that. There is, a, there is a bridge there today that has a private owner. Um, and my understanding of, of the private owner's position is that he not only owns the bridge, but somehow owns the broader crossing. Of course, we don't uh, accept that. It's, a, uh, mm -hmm. it's a obviously a public space, and uh, governments on both sides of the border right. have a right to make sure that we have the ability of the growing cross-border traffic to, uh, to be accommodated within infrastructure, mm -hmm. and I think the preference of all governments would be public infrastructure. Uh, we have found that in terms of your responsibilities on your side of the border, we find ourselves primarily dealing okay. with, the, uh, with the state of Michigan rather than the government of the United States. That's where the locus of authority really is here, and we have a very good 
working relationship with, uh, with the governor there, and we believe we're making significant progress to, uh, to realizing a new crossing, uh, hopefully before I leave office. Well, at least we can agree that that's not a bridge to nowhere. Well, this is the biggest, this is the biggest single, you know, this is the mm -hmm. biggest single um, corridor of trade in the world. And the concept that Absolutely. somebody could claim that he privately owns it all is, is, to, me, uh, is to me ludicrous, but uh, uh, to some degree that is the situation we're dealing with today. Um, good questions, don't you agree? Thank you, folks. These are really good. Uh, a few more. We have five minutes. I don't want to presume on your time, but here, here's one on immigration. How have Canadian immigration policies helped it attract highly skilled labor, and there was a question at noon put to you about visa policy, especially visa policy with Mexico. I think the Mexican press asked that. So um, we're not doing so well in immigration policy. How are you doing? Well, um, you know, like the United States, Canada has always been uh, a land of immigrants, and, uh, you know, I like to remind people, as as in uh, the United States, you will hear lots of critiques of Canadian immigration policy, even in many cases from immigrants themselves. But the fact of the matter is, notwithstanding all of the deficiencies of Canadian immigration policy, that immigration has been, uh, and, and immigrants, have been overwhelmingly successful in Canada. And, you know, the 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 diversity and the dynamism and the energy and the hope that immigrants bring to our two countries, I don't think we can really uh, overstate how important that is. You know, we can, you can look at immigrants just as people who contribute to the economy, but they provide a vitality and excitement about our nations that really is unmatched anywhere. And there are so few places in the world um, Canada, we like to think we're number one in terms of the ability of someone to come from anywhere and become ultimately part of a full-fledged part of the community. That is a very unique experience and in a globalized world where we're increasingly all living uh, much closer than we realize, um, this is a tremendous advantage. You know, you go to a country like Japan. Japan is a wonderful country. But Japan has an aging population problem, as we all do, and, but Japan also has a diversity problem. Japan doesn't have immigration. Mm -hmm. Japan doesn't have the benefits of immigrant, immigration, not just it lacks the economic benefits and the demographic benefits, it lacks the cultural advantages of immigration, which I think are substantial. So uh, I, uh, you know, as I say, notwithstanding all the critiques, immigration has been a great thing for both our countries, particularly for Canada. However, um, our government has said that, uh, you know, in the context of the labor market challenges that we face through an aging population, that making sure immigration better serves our economic and labor force needs is a priority. And we are in the process through the budget and other actions of making some uh, significant changes to our immigration system so that it is more targeted on those economic and labor force needs. It serves those needs well, but often not as much yeah. by design as it should be. Well, that's an ongoing uh, subject of, of discussion here too, as is comprehensive immigration reform, which we came close to enacting a few years back, strongly supported by uh, President Bush 43. Uh, and sadly, we missed it just by a couple of votes. Um, but, but one of the perceptions, I'll just, we have, uh, I'll ask you one more of these questions, but I just wanted to comment on this, that at least I heard from our security folks over the years was that it's much easier to get into Canada than it is to our country, and that one of the worries was um, some folks uh, uh, who are not appealing could get into your country and then try to cross the border to attack us in our country, one of whom was a fellow named Am Ahmad Rasham who was apprehended at the, at the border with Washington State and who had a, a, a rent, rental car with a trunk full of explosives intending to blow up LAX, an airport, then in my congressional district, so I focused on that. But uh, illegal immigration is a challenge in both countries. Yeah, we, uh, we work very closely with our American counterparts on all of these uh, security challenges, and some of the ones you mentioned, there has been mm -hmm. uh, really outstanding uh, cross-border cooperation. But I would say this. 
just in terms of, I sometimes hear, hear these concerns about, you know, dangerous immigration from Canada. I will tell you today, with a, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there's a far higher percentage of illegal immigrants in the United States than in Canada. Right. And I can, I don't I can, think anyone I can would also argue. tell you <laughs> that in terms of movement across the border, in terms of undesirable individuals or weapons, drugs, there is far more that comes north than goes south. Um, so I think that's just something that's important to remember. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> I think our clock has run out, but if you could, you're so quick. I thought, I thought this would be a good end. Uh, there are, uh, sadly, we couldn't get to every question, but this is a, a good way to end this. What, in your experience, is the greatest myth people hold about Canada and Canadians? Yeah, I... <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess I don't know how to answer that. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stories about, I don't know how true they are, about Americans showing up in Canada in the middle of summer wearing winter clothing. Uh, it's, it's, it's not quite that cold all the time. Um, look, I think the greatest, uh, maybe not myth, the greatest misunderstanding, uh, the greatest challenge that Canada has in the United States is that the relationship between us is so deep and so close and for the most part, so seamless, that in spite of its enormous size, Americans simply do not understand the scale and economic consequence mm -hmm. of it. And that is the greatest thing, the greatest challenge that we face. It's the greatest challenge uh, we face is, uh, is often getting, you know, getting attention in the United States to issues that are important to us. Um, you know, as I say, partly because it is such a smooth and seamless relationship for the most part. Um, that's, uh, that's really the big challenge that Canada always faces. It's been a, been a profile challenge in the United States. Um, I, uh, Tom, uh, and, and occasionally we often will find ourselves on matters that are before Congress or before the administration, we find ourselves sometimes getting sideswiped. Uh, you know, like take the Buy America provisions, uh, there'll be other things. We'll often get sideswiped significantly by policies that have absolutely nothing to do with Canada. And, um, and uh, I like to quote Tom Donahue on this. He always reminds me uh, never to take uh, any of this uh, personally or never to take it badly in Canada, as Canadians okay. sometimes do. He says uh, the, only the only reason Americans, the United States sometimes treats Canada badly is because uh, uh, we view Canadians not really as a foreign country, we view, we view Canadians as family and that's how we treat our families. Uh, on um, that note, uh, on behalf of the Wilson Centre Directors Forum, we'd like to thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, and your top government officials and your beloved ambassador uh, for spending, uh, I guess, making this your only private stop on your visit yeah. to well, uh, appreciate, Washington. Appreciate the on opportunity. This trip. It's been great. It's. Uh, I think everyone has enjoyed enormously your humor, your substance, and your commitment to our shared relationship. Thank great. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.